we are back on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. Lindsey Patterson, Mike Santagata. Mike, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, yeah, I turn 28 tomorrow. By the time <gasps> people are listening today. If you, we will know that you listen to the podcast. If you wish <laughs> Mike a happy birthday tomorrow when we post the podcast without even listening to the whole entire clip. So please wish Mike a happy birthday. He does fantastic work over on his Bengals account, Bengals underscore Sands. Make sure you check it out for draft day. It's Eclipse Day. Did you did you see it? Total cloud coverage here. Um, I saw it for a little bit, but yeah, mostly I'm, no. <laughs> I'm one of those people. I'm not going to lie. So we obviously in Cincinnati, we didn't get the the whole entire. I, I, I was I'm, total coverage, but total cloud coverage too. <laughs> there, there were places. Well, I mean, that's that's very that's a bummer because it was blue sky, blue skies here in Cincinnati. But there were other regions. If you drew, if you would drive like in thirty minutes, forty minutes north or over to Indiana, I'm sure other people had a better image. For me personally, I just looked out the window and I saw it get dark, and I thought that was cool. Um, so yeah. I am the lame person who watched the eclipse. I didn't see the whole entire shebang or anything like that. I didn't have the glasses and I work from home. So I just, I set out, I guess we'll have in 2099 is the next time it'll happen. I thought it was 20 years. Is it 70 years away? I don't know. I don't know. I think, it's, I think it's only 20 years away. I think you'll have another shot soon. -ish. But it'll be cool. It's cool if you uh, were able to check it out and uh, kind of just, Nice little Monday event that happened for a lot of people. So really cool stuff. Uh, but moving on to the NFL draft, we are getting so close and I am so grateful. We can finally talk about draft picks two weeks from Thursday. We will do more draft position groups from the offensive line, the wide receivers, tight ends, as we move on in the next few shows before we get to draft night. But decided, actually, I decided, hopefully that was okay, Mike, that we did a mailbag today. Let's get to your Twitter questions. And I will say this. Thank you so much for following along. Bengals underscore Sands at LNDS Patterson. A lot of really great questions. And some of them will move to our, our topic in the third segment that we were actually going to cover anyways. But I will go ahead and uh, go to our first mailbag question of the day. F favorite second round offensive tackle. Okay, I got to look. I've just started. I'm sorry, guys. It's, it's a big year for me. So okay. I have not hit everything. I've just started by second round offensive tackles. I don't love any of them. I'll be honest. Okay. Like, I mean, I think, I mean, Tyler Guyton's consensus ranking is in the top side of the top 32 because he would have been my favorite. I feel similarly, I guess I feel a little similarly about Patrick Paul as to him, but Patrick Paul's a little bit older. Looks a little less athletic on film, although I think he tested like a better athlete. I, yeah, it, I'm going to watch, uh, um, Kingsley, Suam Matea, Roger Rosegarten. I watched Jordan Morgan. I mean, I think he's an interior guy and I actually, I didn't love his film either. Every single guy, Kieran, I don't think I'm finding Yale film. So we'll see about that. But every, every second round offensive tackle seems to be the same mold. Oh, he's long. He's got some athleticism to him and he is raw, very, very raw. And that's okay. I mean, that's kind of what you expect at a second round offensive tackle. This kind of the uh, thing you're dealing with there, but Tyler Guyton, raw, Patrick Paul, raw. When I watched uh, Jordan Morgan, I thought, ah, man, he's raw too. huh? <laughs> it's, uh, I think my favorite second round offensive lineman right now is Zach Frazier, who is a center center only, I think. So that's uh I still have a couple more guys there to watch. I haven't watched Cooper Beebe, Christian Haynes, the, probably anybody you're thinking of. The only interior guys I've watched are Jackson Powers Johnson and Zach Frazier uh, that played interior last season. So I don't know. If Graham Barton somehow falls, I think he's great. I think he's a center. So it's another guy that I don't think is a tackle. This is why I think the Bengals are probably taking a tackle at 18. You don't get into that spot very often. So if one of the top five guys falls to you, you probably just – take it and run. Even if you have Trent Brown, even if that means he's not going to be a 17 game starter. Now I've, I'm sorry to go on a tangent a little bit. I keep seeing the take about, I want a guy that's going to have an impact year one. Trent Brown plays 12 games a year. This guy's having an impact year one. Sign me up. 
he's probably starting five games and he if might he, start more if he could play inside too and take one of those jobs. Let me ask you this though, and we'll get to more of our mailbag questions. Um, and we will go heavy on offensive tackle on Wednesday's episode. You guys will listen to it on Thursday. We'll go more in depth for these uh, possible picks at 18. I know we've talked about him plenty in the off season, but more as we get closer to the draft. If someone could tell you right now that Trent Brown will play 12 games guaranteed, would you take it right now? Yeah. Because he's he has he's done that one time in the past four seasons. So you would say, you know what? If he gives me 12 games, I'm good. That's all I really need. I think I'd do that for 11. 11. Yeah. Okay. I think 10 would be where I draw the line where I go, I, I might roll the dice here and see. Maybe if I get to pick the 10, <laughs> do I get to pick the 10 games he plays? No, you don't. You don't at all. <laughs> they, that's a part of it. You know, it's going to be uh, 10 games that you don't get to choose. Uh, maybe one of them against Miles Garrett. We'll see what that looks like, and, or at least the uh, Browns defense and, and uh, that matchup on, on the line. So, no, it's 12 guaranteed. Hopefully it plays more than that. Uh, but I would mm -hmm. take it right now. But I agree with you, um, you know, when it comes to this offensive line, and we won't get too in-depth for that position group, but it just feels the closer we get to pick 18, the Bengals are going to go tackle. Um, but we'll see what that looks like and see the available person. Because you know what? Last week, they had a lot of trenches visits on both sides of the ball. And um, they're doing more this week of some names that I've never even heard of. So that's good for them. Take advantage of top 30 visits. Just because you have a top 30 visit doesn't mean the Cincinnati Bengals are going to take them at 18. Mm -hmm. They're doing their homework. They're bringing these guys in. They're having extra communication. Um, they're doing everything that a front office should do. So we'll see what happens uh, two weeks from Thursday. Our next Twitter question, mailbag. Okay, I put this one in here because it was taking over. I know this is so random, but you know what? We've seen enough mock drafts, and we'll have another one next week. Did you watch WrestleMania? And then I have a, a follow-up to this one. No. Is there still a follow-up? <laughs> there is. There is. Okay. And you won't be able to answer it, but I wanted to put it on Twitter, and I was nervous about putting it on Twitter mm -hmm. because I felt like I was missing out on this huge event called WrestleMania that I wanted someone to put in – in NFL terms, what it means, what it, what it, what it's like. Obviously, it's wrestling. It's a huge event for a lot of people. And if you love it, you love it. There is nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But you don't watch it, man. I am, no. I am a little surprised. What really? I, I haven't watched wrestling since I think I was like ten. I went to a live event once, though. Well, I saw nice. the, I saw the Undertaker. It was. I know uh, him. But yeah, that's the one guy I might be able to name. Uh, but I thought it was sick when I was 10 years old sitting there just like yelling. They came to Youngstown, Ohio. <laughs> I went. Don't know why they were there. I don't think they filmed. I think it was like a traveling tour type of thing. But I saw The Undertaker. I thought that was cool when I was 10. And uh, I haven't really watched since. So no, um, not my thing. I watched the women's college final last night. And Ooh, not to get why, why was that at three? What what is the NCAA's process? That was at three, and tonight's game is at nine twenty. I know what I, is going on. Put I it know. at seven, eight. I, I will say this: there's two. I mean, I promise we'll get back to our Twitter questions, but I do want to talk about this really quickly about the women's uh, championship and the and the tip times. I agree with you. Tonight, I'm gonna try to stay up, but I probably won't stay up till the very Half end. Time. Fall asleep. Yeah. Half time. And UConn's coach is a big Bengals fan, Dan Hurley. We love that. Um, but at the same time, I saw somebody put this on social media, and I could be wrong, or, and maybe it's a it's a bad take, but I kind of agreed with him. He said 18.7 million people watched the championship. Mm -hmm. Putting it in the afternoon on a Sunday, perfect. Absolutely perfect. Maybe mm, 7 p.m.? Just, yeah, like a six start, seven start. Like I feel like maybe they could have got 20 million. I don't know though. I'm not a oh. I'm not a TV expert. I just feel like three o'clock. I know it surprised it was everybody I was with. We went. Uh, somebody saw like women's college final starts in like 15 minutes, and I went. There's no way it's 2:45. Mm -hmm. And then I checked my phone. It starts at three. Okay, sure. So we put it on. It was a great game. Um, so it was awesome, man. I, and I will be completely honest with you. I've only had an interest in, and I used to play basketball, obviously not at that level, uh, but I've had an interest in the last two years. And it, it's one of the biggest reasons, Caitlin Clark, and I love the other names that we're, we're seeing in, in women's college basketball, but uh, that was awesome. And, and obviously we should have been closer to the final seconds, but um, just 
just a fun game, fun tournament for them. Yeah, for sure. I loved it. I thought that it was very fun. Hope the men's college final is yeah. very fun tonight, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. All right, we made it through two questions. All right, two questions. And I knew this would happen. One more question. We'll move on to our next segment of the mailbag. Will more teams carry fullbacks to the new with the new kickoff rule in the NFL? I have no idea if that would be related to the kickoff rule. I uh, I'm not the expert in this. I have not thought that much about it. I just want to see what the coaches do for mm -hmm. the kickoff rule. I want to see what that's like. I've heard it's more like you need a running back back there than a old style kick return type guy. I I guess that's how you move to. They're also going to add a fullback back there. I don't know. I feel like special teamers, it's been just guys that have the want to and probably don't have a locked roster spot otherwise. So you get a maniac of some type and put him back there. It doesn't have to be a fullback. Maybe. I think if you see more fullbacks, it's because teams have been getting lighter and lighter and playing deeper and deeper in coverage. So running the ball and 12 personnel and possibly I formation 21 personnel is uh, in vogue on its way back. So that would be, I think a bigger reason you'd see fullbacks more than the kickoff rules, but I'm also not a kickoff rules expert. I don't know enough about it. I know it's going to be a learning experience and I'm, I guess I'm supposed to be really excited about it. Um, all the different rules and, and if at least the more kick returns and it's safer. I'm, I mean, that's awesome. I just, I, I don't watch the UFL XFL very often. <laughs> I don't either. I, I can't tell you how many games they've already played this season. Sorry if you love it. Good for you. I just don't know where they're at right now. Well, just a few questions into our segment one of our mailbag. We'll get to more. Again, make sure you follow Mike Bengals underscore fans. You can follow me at LNDS Patterson on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. We are back on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. Again, great questions. I know a lot of people wanted to talk about a certain player. I'm going to move him to segment three when it comes to the NFL draft and the Bengals. We'll take a chance on him. But let's go ahead and get to another Twitter question. Why should the Bengals get a tight end or interior defense? The offensive line. So I'm reading this. I'm butchering it because I know what the tweet originally said. So I apologize in advance, producer Spencer. It was why shouldn't the Bengals get a tight end or interior offensive line in the first round? In the first okay. four rounds? Yeah, we could do pros and cons. Okay. I mean, to me, I'm all about just drafting BPA. If I, I personally, I think Troy fought Fatan. Wait, hold on. I saw how this was pronounced. I know, Dan Ford. Fautanu? Yeah, I do. I, I think. Mm -hmm. Pretend I said it right. I think he is the best interior offensive line. I know he played tackle. Uh, and I would take him at 18. I think he, if you're talking about a guy that I think is pro bowl, all pro level ceiling on the inside would help cover up some of the weaknesses of his game. I think he's pretty polished. He might be 24, but you're not going to get a perfect prospect here. That would be going in the top 10, even if they are interior and thinking of Quentin Nelson, get a really, really good prospect. If he, it, to me, I think that the value of a tackle is higher, but at the end of the day, I'm not going to reach like, say you're drafting between guys. You don't like a Mary Simmons fails your health check, but he's available, but you can't draft him because your doctors failed. Him. Like they think he is too much of a risk for you to take. And then the other guys available, like people keep talking about Jackson Powers Johnson. I like Troy Fautanu more than Jackson Powers Johnson. And I like Graham Barton more actually as well. I think all three, I would give a passing solid grade or higher if they took him at 18, because I would rather get a very good interior offensive lineman than reach and get a project tackle. And I actually don't think Amarius Mims is as big of a project as people think. But when I'm talking about like Tyler Guyton or one of these guys that I watch and I go like, ah, man, there's a lot of work that needs done here for him to become a good starter. When I look at the interior guys are like, I think he could be a solid guy year one with all pro type potential. Yeah, I'd take that. I think Jackson Powers Johnson and Grant Parton actually also both have Pro Bowl, all pro level potential as well. I don't think Zach Frazier does. That's when I make my <laughs> cutoff interior offensive line four. I think he's like, all right, I think that's a solid starter. That's what I see. Um, this is a little bit of a weakness there that I don't know if he can overcome to become one of the best in the league. So when looking at all that, I, I just think, yeah. That's why I would take an interior offensive line in the first four rounds. The con is it's not a valuable position. And this kind of goes for tight end too. I mean, 
you take Brock yeah. Bowers if he's there at 18. I don't care about the takes. That's okay. Blue blue chip talent falls that far. I don't care what position he plays or what the Bengals have done in the past with that position. I'm taking him. And you figure out a way to make it work, or the coaching staff probably shouldn't be there because I think they would find a way to make it work. If we believe that they can make Gasicki work, they can make Brock Bowers work. He's a much better version of what he's going to do. So, and he's a better blocker. He's a better receiver. He just can't dunk on guys the same way. Um, yeah. So I, I would, I don't think you have to take either one of these in the first four rounds. There is a need at both spots. I think I would cut the, the, the first four rounds are so large, like, especially because they have that extra third round pick. I almost want to say like, this would be a better debate for the first two rounds where you're talking about position value. You're talking about like, how oh, should they, shouldn't they, you know, are you reaching for a valuable position or are you going to reach positional value wise? I would rather reach position positional value wise. If I have a guy that's graded ahead of the other ones. So that would be my pros and cons is that you're getting a less valuable position. You can see that by the market. You can see that by the extensions that they won't probably give to an interior offensive lineman. If he turns out to be an all pro or a pro bowler, they probably wouldn't Brock Bowers, but I don't know about every tight end. Um, fifth year option, then, man. You got a fifth yeah, year option on Brock Bowers in the first round. It's pretty nice. That's lovely. And plus what tight ends make versus a wide receiver. Oh yeah. It God. is getting cheaper. If you want to be the analytic brain, you're getting a cheaper wide receiver. And the, the cap on that is if he hits, he's cheaper. If he doesn't hit, he's not that expensive. It's, I feel like a lower risk version of drafting Brian Thomas Jr. Well, you know, actually, I think he's much better. So it's lower, it's a lower risk version of drafting, I don't know, Roma Dunze or Malik Neighbors or something that's like a blue chip talent guy that they talk about. Yeah, and, and I want this to make sense what I'm about to say when it comes to the Brock Bowers that you know, will he hit? What's it gonna look like in this offense? But you know, a couple years ago when they drafted Dax Hill, which I'm not out on Dax Hill, I am still a Dax Hill fan. I hope Dax Hill succeeds. But it does I'm feel agnostic. But it but it does feel a little different, you know, going into the season. He brings on <laughs> Bell back. We'll see what it looks like. Jordan Battle had a really great rookie year when they put him out there. They expect him to be on the field. Um, but if it doesn't work out with Dax Hill, I'm just like, let's go. Let's, you know, just roll the dice. And, and if Brock Bowers is there at 18, it's a need. It's a need for this team. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll, but, but you're not going to draft because you have Gasicki, who's been on three teams in three years or whatever. Or no. Drew Sample, who basically is playing a different position than Brock Bowers, or Tanner Hudson, who's 30. I mean, I'm taking Bowers. It's a need. Yeah. You know what's crazy, though, is Zach Taylor hasn't – or not just Zach Taylor alone, his staff, front office, they haven't drafted a tight end since Drew Sample. Yeah, I just think that's coincidence. That's wild. No, and I don't think that they're like, you know what, we're never going back. Because, look, Drew Sample's still on contract with this team. They um, made their tight end coach go to, like, 100 different pro days last year. Yeah, no, no, no. I And I, I truly believe if Don Kincaid <laughs> Maybe he's there, failing them, though. Maybe he's going out there saying, like, ah, I don't like him. He's no Drew Sample. <laughs> but, but at the same time, I do think – and we'll never know. We'll never know what it would have looked like. But I do think Don Kincaid would have been an option for them. It was obviously so yeah. close for them to, to pick Don Kincaid, and he was gone. Um, so we'll see. No, I agree with you. Um, you know, Brock Bowers is there. You you got to go at 18. And, and other than that, the first four rounds, uh, I'm, for me personally, left guard is the, is your biggest weakness right now. And I know we, we already talked about Trent Brown. You get about 10, 12, about hopefully 12 or, or more games from him at, at a left or right tackle. And you get Orlando Brown at left tackle. Um, your interior still needs some depth at center behind Ted Karras and just the future in general. Ted Karras is gone after this yeah. season, possibly. Add interior. Add interior. I would feel so great if they were able to not only get a left guard, but also a center in this draft with one of those 10 picks that they currently have, if they use mm -hmm. all of them. Give me depth so badly in interior for Joe Burrow. So, yeah, I, I feel like the pros are more there than the cons for your interior I and agree. your tight end. But, I think yeah, the way you, you don't take it is just you get value at wide receiver and defensive tackle, and maybe you draft, uh, I don't know. Running back in the first four rounds, that could happen. And then you need one more position. Uh, nose, maybe you just draft two defensive tackles, or you could throw in, I mean, fourth round. I mean, corner is always on the table for them. So, always. There's, 
yeah, there's a way it doesn't happen, but I feel like it's more likely it does happen. And I think we're both on the pro side of this. Yeah. All right. We'll go ahead and get to uh, another question in our mailbag. If not, funny, I love that it's here. If Brock ba This is a good question, though. If Brock Bowers is there at 15, does Cincinnati trade up? Do they or should they? Do they? No. Should they? I would. What are you giving up? I mean, to move up three spots, what is that, like a fourth rounder? I, I'm not an expert on draft trade charts. Like, yeah. give up a fourth rounder, you have two-thirds. I would give take a, a third. Yeah. You give up a third to move up three spots? I would have been offering that at 12, 13, 14. Maybe it doesn't get accepted until 15. I don't know. I'm not yeah. an expert. Why I not? Probably, if you're I 15? Might, ah, top 100 pick, though, to move up three spots? Ah, I might. They, they wouldn't. That they would be. Wouldn't. They wouldn't. They, they wouldn't. So, like, there's no point in talking about that. You're right. That, you're but, right. What, what, what you would do. Yeah. 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 They might not do it unless they could do it for like a fifth. <laughs> <laughs> they would. They'd be like, and I know Mike doesn't make Jackson Carmen in a seventh. <laughs> can I know. We move up. I know. Matt, I know Mike Brown doesn't make the calls anymore, but they. I can just see him right now in the room and just say, "Oh, you want a third? Hangs up." <laughs> and he's like, "We're staying where we're at." A fifth. How do you feel? All right. How do you feel about Jackson Carmen and Deontay Smith? Both uh, package deal. <laughs> Done. <laughs> and a sixth and a sixth and a sixth and we get back a seventh we need to have the same amount of picks <laughs> they would they would i would i trust everything about that happening and they get a draft pick back so we'll see what happens but yeah i, I don't know how i feel and, and before we get to our next question and, and we will talk more tight ends next week but do you think brock bowers is even there at 15 as we get no closer? i think he goes in the top 10 now because i feel yeah. like it goes everywhere I felt this way, like when I remember I did the Bijan Robinson thing last year because mm -hmm. nobody values running bags and whatever. And I remember thinking, like, this guy's not going to be available. Right. But like all the PFF mocks and all the other mocks were saying, like, hey, he might be there. It's like, oh, we won't. And I feel the way Brock, about Brock Bowers. When it comes to blue chip talent, the position of value doesn't matter as much. Like one team is going to fall in love and they're just going to take are. it. I think it'll be in the top 10. Might be our old friends at Tennessee. It could be Jim Harbaugh in Los Angeles, but I feel like somebody no. is falling for it at least in the top 12. I think uh, the Chargers would be absolutely silly not to get neighbors. If he's available, I mean. You don't think he's going to, well, I guess five, he could be gone. Yeah, he could be. They pick five, fifth? Yeah, they pick fifth, I man. I don't know why I thought they picked seventh. No, they uh, picked fifth. Oh, that's, that's the Titans. That's the Titans, seventh. yeah. They could pick Bowers at fifth. I mean, they could also like Bowers more than neighbors. I don't think that's crazy. Man, give give me Malik all the way down to 18 right now. That would be well, that's that's also not happening. I know, I know. It was a dream. It was a dream that actually looked like a possibility at a certain moment of the season, and now it's not. Um, but yeah, let's see what happens. Brock Bowers, I agree with you. I think he's probably gonna be top 10. It'd be great if he fell and other players and every team that needed a quarterback went quarterback heavy for five or six guys. But I don't know if that'll happen. One more uh, Twitter mailbag question of the day. Is Marius Mims lack of snaps at Georgia being overblown and obviously the injury history of what everybody wants to tag to his name? Um, I think it depends who you talk to. Cause some people are just like, he's not on my board. Didn't play enough. And it's like, mm -hmm. I trust the medical professionals to figure that out because I think there are enough snaps to get a feel for who he is. They brought him in for a top 30 visit, I assume, to get medicals, a close-up look, and for the positional coaches, head coach, whoever, to work him out physically on the field, get a close-up look at him that way as well. If that passes everything, then no, it, it, he should be taken. And I, I think that it would be being overblown. Um, but, yeah, the other end of it is just, like, throwing him out because – he didn't play enough snaps. I think that would be, that would be, uh, that would, it, it, it is being overblown in that case. Uh, because I think you could, I very easily see the future, uh, not in general, but <laughs> this possibility, I very easily see this possibility. You look back three years from now and Amarius Mims is like in a tier by himself with the offensive tackles. That would be I could terrible. see that. That will make me so heartbroken if he's not a Bengal and that happens. Not not for him. I wish him success. But, uh, man, if yeah. they missed out. But I could also see the, the career path that he's missing games left and right. And teams are still not sure what they have in three years. So 
I see it going both ways. I think this is huge for the medical staff of whoever takes him. It just needs one to pass him. Because if he played more, he'd be going in the top eight, top five, maybe. He just feels like where their tackles are at right now with Orlando Brown and Trent Brown, the perfect one to bring in. Huge guy. Mm -hmm. Um, And as your tackle, and he doesn't have to contribute right away, his rookie year, but he's available if you do need him, if Trent Brown doesn't make it a a whole season, if there's an injury with Orlando Brown Jr. um, You know, you just, you have that in a rookie would be absolutely huge. But I agree with you. But the thing is about the NFL draft, I think we all have to remember that you never know what you're really getting for a lot of these players. You know, you hope and you see them in college. I mean, besides we just talked about Brock Bowers, you got guys like Malik Neighbors and, uh, you know, other wide receivers who we've seen even the Cincinnati Bengals draft and Jamar Chase. But there, it could be – it could be a huge miss. We, we just don't know what it, what it will look like in the NFL. And if the Bengals draft him, I hope they hit it. I hope he has a incredible NFL career and they have their tackle of the future. But um, we'll see what happens. And we'll talk more about him and, and the other offensive tackles on Wednesday's podcast. Because, again, just really feels like that's where the Cincinnati Bengals are going to go at 18. And we'll be two weeks away. On Thursday, looking forward to NFL Draft. Make sure you're following Mike. Thanks again for all the Twitter questions. Everybody rocks. There were several. I, we didn't get to all, all of them, obviously. Uh, but we'll do another one next Monday as we get ready for the NFL Draft and a nice little mock draft Monday. Uh, one more question, though, I do want to get to in our next segment because a lot of people were tweeting Mike about this and um, possible prospect. Do the Cincinnati Bengals go that route or do they say no next on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati? Three, two, one. We are back on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. Obviously, this news broke yesterday. Tavondre Sweat, the DWI, right before the draft. I feel like this always happens with the prospect. The news, just be smart. But unfortunately, uh, that news came out yesterday. And uh, to be determined if that factors into where he gets drafted, it really felt like for me personally that a lot of people were talking about him. Oh, the Bengals should draft him in the second round. The Bengals should get him. He'd be absolutely perfect for them. I felt like he'd probably be gone by the time they pick in the second round just because of the hype and how popular he has become when it comes to NFL prospects for maybe other teams in the second round or maybe they're higher on him and he won't be available by the time the Bengals pick. But with this news coming out, do you think the Cincinnati Bengals say no or it really doesn't change too much and he is probably available in the second or third round when they draft? Um, I don't think this specifically would knock them, knock him off their board. And I only get to that thought because of Jackson Carmen from a few years ago and the stories that came out after the draft that they knew about. I, I, this wasn't something they didn't know about and into that. So if they think that Mike Brown, not opposed to taking somebody on like that. Mm-hmm. So I don't think he's off the table. I think, first two rounds yeah third round they got two picks there if he's available maybe the issue with it comes with they skipped dewan jones last year for weight concerns and off the field effort concerns off the field concerns that way did they get burned by jackson carmen get burned by uh, the lsu nose tackle i can't think of that barely played uh (laughs) Shelvin. Yeah, Tyler Shelvin. They get burned enough by Tyler Shelvin and Jackson Carmen. Was that the same draft? Uh, it was a yeah, bad draft. Same draft. Same draft class. They get burned so much by that that they won't do it anymore. I don't know. Uh, that would be the question because they did. I, I'm fairly certain they skipped Dewan Jones because of that. So do they view that? Some, because this is a worse case than what Dewan Jones had. Dewan Jones fell to the fourth round. So it could he could yeah. even fall further. And uh We'll see. I don't think he takes him off. This takes him off their board completely, but it could in conjunction with the other issues. They brought him in for a top 30 visit. Totally made sense for him to come on top 30 visit because they want to get an up close look at him, not just in general, but they probably wanted to weigh him. They probably wanted to test his like personality and try to get a feel for him as a person I mean, the same way that they bring in Tyre Tart and he doesn't pass that, so then he leaves. They're trying to do that with Tavondre Sweat as well. Clearly the best nose tackle in this class to me. 
and to pretty much everybody um, and a need for the Bengals. They don't have one. So it made a ton of sense to bring him in because of these questions. Did he pass that, fail that? That might matter more than this arrest does. But I will just say, what a sad like yeah. story. I mean, you are two weeks away from achieving wealth, your dreams, et cetera. Like, and then with the stories about he's up front with his partying from before this season and how he's changed, the teams are going to throw that out the window. Yeah. Now that this happens, I mean, it's easier than ever to not get DUIs, DWIs, what I don't really know the difference, but whatever. Uh, Uber, Uber, you've got every Friends. ride service out there. Friends. I don't know where it happened, but uh, I'm sure if he was near the University of Texas, he could go, hey, I'm I'm DeFondre Sweat. Can somebody give me a ride? <laughs> yeah. Well, people probably would. I know if, if I would. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, sure. Whatever, man. Yeah. It's just fun. like. Dude, right before, I mean, and again, I, I don't know how far he'll fall in the NFL draft. Maybe he doesn't fall and maybe he gets drafted in the second round to another team. Um, but it's just like, be smarter about these this stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's so easy. And and, and luckily, um, hopefully, I, I didn't see any additional update from the story. Hopefully nobody was was hurt from it. So it's just, just make smarter decisions, man. Uh, but we'll see. I agree with you. I don't think he's off the Bengals draft board at all. Um, maybe he... I shouldn't say at all. I, I I would be I guess a little surprised if he was available, maybe even in the third round, and they and they went another direction. Uh, but there was another question, and and not going too far back into the mailbag, but I thought it was a really good question because I feel like we're talking a lot about nose tackles, and we'll kind of wrap up with this. How many teams in the NFL have a true nose tackle? I mean, I don't have the number. What you're really looking for is what teams are playing odd fronts on early downs. For the most part, because the way Houston played their defense last year, they almost never got to they played even fronts. The difference there is odd front you usually have three down linemen, maybe five. It's what the Bengals play on early downs more often than not. And you've got a true nose tackle. Either he's head up or he's in a shade, which is right off the shoulder of the center. That's where he that's that's where he goes. When you play even fronts, that guy can be, and the Bengals play these plenty too, but it's usually their nickel package. It's not their base package. You need to have a nose tackle for your base package if you're playing odd fronts, which maybe the Bengals won't do that this season. I don't know. That would be contrary to what Lou Anarumo has done in his career as the Bengals defensive coordinator. But in that case, you're playing four down linemen. Think, I mean, all the Marvin Lewis teams, which they had to Montepeco. So, like, it's not unheard of to have those tackles in this front. But this is where you can get away with not having one. You just slant, you stunt, you play fast. You, you usually have a guy inside one of those A gaps, a two I, maybe a one tech, and uh, which could be called a shade, a G, whatever. Um, that guy doesn't have to be the same size as when you have a DJ reader that's playing slow and trying to control both a gaps to gapping. You have to play a different defense. Cause I don't think you could go out and play the, in the Bengals discovered this last season when DJ reader got hurt because they don't have depth. They didn't have depth at nose tackle. So what they did, they moved to start playing more even fronts. They started slanting more. They started trying to play fast. It didn't really work. I mean, the, the numbers with DJ reader on versus off the field were drastic. I mean, that's just to be expected in the run game. But that's the direction you probably have to go is, okay, we – so you don't get Tavondre Sweat. You didn't get Taylor Tart. And you aren't going to take one of the older guys and just throw him out there. You probably don't want to play Josh Tupo a ton. I think the point of addressing defensive tackle is so Carter and Tupo weren't seeing the field as much, although right now they are. Yeah. Uh, until they address, which I think they're going to draft somebody who knows who, but I think they will draft somebody. Um, you, you play more four, four down stuff. You play more even front stuff. You play four, three, you brought Akeem Davis Gaither back. Maybe you're going to see an increase in Akeem Davis Gaither snaps. Maybe this is how you, I, I don't see it, but like maybe you play big, big nickel or you put a, an extra safety on the field. I, Personally, I don't see them doing it, but I think that's more likely now than it was, even if it's only like 2%, 3% more likely now than it was when I thought they would get a nose tackle. Cause right now I don't know if they do maybe a, a day three pick, like we talked about with Tavondre Sweat, we would expect them to probably take that chance on day three 
maybe late day two, like very end of day two, their last third round pick. But yeah, I don't have the exact number, but when you look at teams, like the Ravens don't really play odd fronts. So what do they do? They play even fronts. They have nose tackles. They have Travis Jones. So most teams have somebody that they put out there, even if it, they don't play that many snaps, or even if they don't play head up nose that often, you're going to see that they'll have somebody on the roster that they trust that can do it. And I thought Sheldon Rankins actually played more nose than I expected, which by that I mean two eye and like just inside the guard. I don't mean head up over the center, but more than I expected because they played sides. So the offense could kind of dictate where guys lined up and they want to put Sheldon Rankins in that position so they can get more easy double teams on him, especially in, uh, on the passing downs. But yeah, I, I think I've seen it go around. I think personally, I feel like you should, if not, like, I think you should have one, if not need one, even if it's just for goal line stuff or just mm -hmm. somebody that can see the field and play a little bit. You can't have a guy that gets blown off the field, even though he's he's big. He could be a nose tackle. And the same with if they draft, like, I don't know, somebody. Brand, Braden Fiske, if they draft him and they're like, ah, we got three guys. We'll just throw one of those guys at nose tackle. No, I mean, that guy's probably getting blown off the ball. I mean, B.J. Hill would have the best chance at surviving yeah. between the three of them. But, yeah, probably, probably not a good idea. So I feel like you need to have somebody that can at least take snaps there, even if it's not a guy that's going to take more than – 15% of snaps, 20% of snaps in the season. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are, there are ways to have a good run defense and not have a nose tackle that sees the field 50, 60% of snaps. Yeah. We'll see what the Cincinnati Bengals do in the draft, but uh, more than likely they will pick one up in the draft to determine uh, to be the, where they decide to get their nose tackle. Uh, what's going to be up on all Bengals? I'm trying to do an Amarius Mims piece, so I think that'll be up this week. I feel like he's worth talking about because he is pretty likely. I think he's a likely candidate that the Bengals could select. I wouldn't have him at number one, but I think if he passes their medicals, it make a ton of sense that they take him. Played right tackle. He went to a big school. Um, he's big himself. I think. I think he's a complex uh, discussion. I think he's a complex guy to figure out exactly where you would take him, if you would take him, et cetera. I think there is also the discussion of he hasn't played many snaps. That means he's raw. Well, how raw and how raw is raw? Because it, I think he is actually a little bit put together. So, yeah, I, I'm interested. I honestly, not to make you guys not read my piece, I think he goes before 18. That's just my gut feeling is that – because you just need – some team, I think, from that 12 to 17 range, if so one Saints. team, yeah, if one team passes his medicals, he'll, they'll probably take him because the talent's undeniable. But, yeah, come read about it. Hopefully it's up soon. And that'll leave J.C. Latham to fall all the way to 18. That is uh, still the most likely pick. I have not moved just, off of that. No, but it just feels like it. And I'm not saying that's good or bad, but we'll talk more about that on uh, Wednesday's pod. Make sure you check out Mike's work. Follow him up on Twitter, Bengals underscore Sand. You can follow me at LNDS Patterson. Thank you for listening to It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. <laughs>